Sunday, August 21st, 1966, a perfect day for an execution. Approximately 122 miles southwest of Las Vegas, a 1963 Buick LeSabre, license plate FUP744, is hammering along US Highway 91, Interstate 15. Ed was driving my car, the 63 Buick. Pat Blackwell was in the back seat with all his camera stuff. I had a typewriter with me, and it was Ed's typewriter. One of the feet was broken off of it. I said, man, I don't have any place to put my feet. So I said, I'll buy you another typewriter. Ed, let's throw this thing out the window. And he said, toss it. At 5.07 PM, the passenger window rolls down. We saw a flat place up ahead. And I said, OK, get her up to 90 miles an hour. And at the right moment, I just tossed it. The wreckage stretches along 189 feet of asphalt and Nevada desert. Either me or Ed said, you know, we should go back and photograph that. If there was ever an investigation of this, was it an accident or was it a murder? It was too directly bound to its own anguish to be anything other than a cry of negation, carrying within itself the seeds of its own destruction. Ed Ruscha and Mason Williams' Royal Road Test is still one of my favorite books. It looks like a technical manual. It's a little yellow spiral-bound notebook, the kind of thing that you might have received as an instruction manual with a new Royal typewriter. Scene of strewn wreckage. Figure and foreground points to impact area. There's no real explanation of it. You're just kind of confronted with the bald facts of it in these really stark black and white photos the kind of thing that you might see if someone was investigating a crime scene. Carriage assembly. Then you're left trying to make sense out of it. When I found that book, it was, it was kind of a definitive moment for me. Like I looked at it and I thought, yeah, this is the grave of typewriting. This is the moment when it stopped being one thing and started being something else. Here we are now, lot 84, Cormac McCarthy's Olivetti Manual Typewriter, on which he has typed all but one of all of his novels, including three not yet published. And I can open up, it is on the left at 45,000, 48,000, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, 80,000, 85,000, 90,000, 95,000, 120,000, came all this way, 170,000, 180,000. 190,000, 200,000, you want to say 210, 210,000, $210,000, last chance then and selling, 210,000, congratulations sir, paddle 623. We've become a throwaway society. Obsolete. Depends on your point of view, I guess. We'll uh, take care of it for you. Have it fixed. No time at all. I've been repairing typewriters here in Berkeley for 38 years. You name it, I've probably worked on it. The first six or seven years that I was in this business, I ate, drank, slept Smith Corona typewriters. The Standard, the Sterlings, the Clipper, the Silence, the Super Silence, the Galaxies, the Classic 12s, the Skyriders. I like them because they got a cool, nice touch on them. I think that Smith Corona is like a good version of a Chevy. It holds up. You know, it's not a Benz like maybe an Olympia might be, but it's a good Chevy. Quiet, dependable. California Typewriter is a small family-run business. It's just the owner, Herb, his daughters, and me. You have to um, push up on here. Herb bought the typewriter shop back in the early 80s, just about the time the personal computer came on the scene. He's an ex-IBM guy. He knows the IBM Selectric and the ball machine. He's probably the best Selectric guy I know. I mean, I've worked on a few, but I, I can't come close to his skills on a Selectric. 
Herb's got a dream that people are going to come back to typewriters. My dad believes that there are various people all over the place totally excited about typewriters. I think he thinks it's somewhat of a wave of the future, that the more people are going to come back to them just for different reasons. He's hopeful, for sure. And he's willing to spend his last dime. I probably have 250 plus typewriters in my collection, and I would say that 90% of them are in perfect working order. I've tried to foster a community of typewriting people, and it hasn't quite worked. I've given typewriters to folks because I have a lot of spares, and if somebody says, geez, I'd like to have a typewriter at letters, it's, it's, on their, it's on their desk within 48 hours with a note from me explaining the typewriter to them. I go to their houses later on, they have it up on a shelf somewhere like it's an object of art. And I say, get that bad boy down. Put it on that, put it on your desk. Have it right there so you can always type something to somebody. I type almost every day. I, there's usually a memo that I'm sending to somebody or a question or a thank you note or uh, an actual response. I hate getting email thank yous from folks. Hey, we had a great time last night, you know, or hey, I really appreciate you doing that. So really, you appreciated it so much that you took seven seconds to send me an email. Now, if they take 70 seconds to type me out something on a piece of paper and send it to me, well, I'll keep that forever. Otherwise, I just delete that email. Look, there's always going to be great watches that are made. You'll have to pay a premium for them. The truth is, no good typewriters are ever going to be made again. They're, they, they're, no matter how much of a premium you're going you're gonna to want to pay for them, there's no factory, there's no businessman in the world who's going to open up a factory and says, we are going to make the finest typewriter that will last absolutely forever, and anybody who's willing to pay the $17,000 for a Hanks typewriter, will ne they're going to pass it down to their gen- no, it's not, that's not going to, you might do that with a watch. Uh, you might do that, you know, there'll always be a new iPad that's coming down the pike, there's always going to be good cars and things like that, but no one is ever going to make the great typewriter ever, ever, ever again. Boo hoo. When I was a kid, I didn't really think about the future. We are constantly building things. We built go-karts, we built balsa wood gliders, we built a five-story tree house. And it was the house that the neighborhood kids came to play. My parents didn't care what we did. They didn't worry about noise and we could build things in my father's workshop. It was a tremendous childhood. My name is Martin Howard. I've been collecting 19th century typewriters from the 1880s and 1890s for 22 years now. I didn't want to collect Swiss music boxes or microscopes or telescopes. I wanted to collect something that was sort of off the radar in that regard. The quality of how things were built at that time is spectacular. Cast and machine made parts, beautifully painted. It's the wild west of typewriters. My collection, I call the Martin Howard collection. They're all typewriters of non-standard design. During the 1880s and 1890s, there were many different styles of typewriters, but there were two main classes of typewriters. One was the keyboard typewriter, and the other, what we call them now, index typewriters. I really love typewriters that are the genesis of an idea, the very beginning form. Even if it was a failure down the road and died out on the evolutionary tree, that's okay, I like the beginning of, of any idea. One of the things I love finding in my typewriters when I'm working on them is a dried spider, um, a spider from the 1880s or 1890s. What it tells me is that nobody has raided the tomb and I'm the first to crack open this typewriter. The only typewriter of great historical note that's missing from my collection 
is a Scholes and Glidden typewriter. The Scholes and Glidden is the first commercially successful typewriter. It appeared in 1874. It's of the utmost historical importance, and after years of collecting, it still eludes me. I feel like I'm just as much a typewriter person as anybody who actually likes to see typewriters intact. It's just that I have a different way of coming at it. Some collectors, typewriter enthusiasts, don't like that I do this. They get riled up as if I'm going to destroy thousands of typewriters, and that's not really the case. Most of the ones I take apart are in pretty rough shape. I don't really hack into them. I'm pretty gentle when I destroy them. I'd always wanted to take a typewriter apart since I was 10 or 11. My mom had an old Underwood and I'd always sit alongside of it and hit the keys and look at all the machinery inside and want to kind of be in there and see it. From the key getting pushed to the type bar hitting the platen, that was great. Just couldn't get enough of it. At the time this Queen video came out, with bits and pieces of uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis. That's kind of how the typewriter looked to me, like those little planes flying through Metropolis. When I looked inside, I felt like I was flying through the typewriter, as if it were this big city machine. I've seen Metropolis more times than I can count. I moved to Oakland three years ago after living in the mountains for almost 18 years. I was living in the woods basically, making what appeared to be naked robots out of machine parts. It didn't really go over very well there. I didn't know for sure if it was good or if it was worth looking at or if it was worth anybody's time, so I had to come here to, to see. A lot of it's my own compulsion, my own need to make art and be an artist. When I first moved here, I didn't really know anybody. I was driving through Berkeley one day and I saw this sign with a typewriter logo on it. It said California typewriter and I looked in the window. Sure enough, there were typewriters. I'm always nervous to tell people who like typewriters about what I do. Cause some people don't, you know, some people don't like it. But the Vermilions are super friendly and they're like the first friends I made when I got here. Occasionally they'll call me and ask me if I have a certain part, like a carriage return lever, platen knobs, mainsprings, really common parts that I have boxes full of. Yeah, this won't fly, but uh, that's the guy I need right there, so that one's gonna do it. Yeah, that'll fit. I, I usually take them all the way apart. If I can give him any kind of part that he needs to put into a functioning typewriter, I'm, I'm happy to do it. It's pretty common, actually. Yeah. Cool, cool. You know, Smith Corona is... Oh, okay. Herb has a lot of IBM Selectrics. Some of them are just too far gone, too hard to repair. So he gives them to me instead of throwing them away. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. All right, see you later. 
Catch you later. I feel like I've been peripatetic since I was an infant. I basically grew up in the back seat of a Plymouth. I don't like flying. I'd rather be in a car. But it's really hard to write a play while you're on the move because you have to focus, you know. I feel my great strength as a writer is being alone. Aloneness is a condition of writing. You look at all the writers that have come up with something with its own salt, you know, and they're utterly alone, you know, you know all of them. The plays that really bore me to death are the ones in which the writer's thinking all the time, causing the actors and the, the characters to speak for the author, you know. It's very boring compared to a character who speaks for himself. There's a certain framework of time that takes shape around a play. Sometimes you might fly through a three-act play and write it in a week or two. And a one-act play might take you a year. One of the keys to leaving a piece of writing and coming back to it is to leave it at the point where you know it's about to go somewhere. Don't come to a dead end and stop and say, oh my God, you know, and walk away and come back because you're going to be in the same dead end as you left it. You know? I just never got along with the computer screen. It's somehow removed from the tactile experience, you know. When you go to ride a horse, you have to saddle it. When you use a typewriter, you have to feed it paper. There's a percussion about it. You can see the ink flying onto the surface of the paper. So a letter will go bam like that, but along with it is the ink kind of flying into the paper. I'd rather ride a horse than drive a car, but that puts you in a, a very different uh, relationship to the modern world. You know? Well, neither rain nor prices proved to be obstacles for Apple customers today who wanted to snap up the new iPad on the very first day. The rain held off until 3 a.m. along San Francisco's Stockton Street. One line was for customers who had pre-ordered their new iPads online. Another was for those who hadn't. Throughout the morning, we've been seeing this line here at the downtown San Francisco Apple Store growing. Right now, it stretches about half a block down Ellis and continues to grow. Well, things have been tough up and down all along. We've had loans, we've had second mortgages, we've had all our credit cards maxed out just to keep the business rolling. When you like what you do, you could almost get paid peanuts. And if you can get by on peanuts, that's fine. Uh, this is a Hermes made in Switzerland, early 60s. My oldest son found it in a swap meet somewhere in California. And it was in fairly rough shape. We had to kind of rebuild it. Or, I mean, some people who knew what they were doing rebuilt it, you know. It's a beautiful typewriter and, and it feels great. Of all the manual typewriters I have, it has the greatest feel. I, just in the keys themselves, you know, the way they cup your finger and stuff, you know. I mean, this is as good as it gets. There's the whole deal right there. So simple and complex. You know, it's almost like you're a kid working on your bicycle. You can see what's happening with it. The lever goes up, the carriage moves, the letter leaves its mark. You just can't get that kind of fascination out of a piece of electronic equipment. The magic moment came at 8 o'clock when the doors opened. I'm fairly well known for, you know, sort of standing next to new technology and finding a way to incorporate it into what I'm doing. I was on stage 
several years with Steve Jobs introducing Apple software and hardware. I mean, they would come to my house and show me stuff and it would be mind blowing and I would say, oh, I can't wait to use this. For me, I feel like the next step in technology is less about what you're using and more about how you're using it. In between my second and third record, I went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and I saw all these great classic seminal songs that were written on hotel paper or you know, whatever paper was around and I mean you can see right into their ideas. You could see uh, who scratched out a lot of ideas and which ideas came to people really quickly. And I thought to myself, wow, I don't have any representation of this. I have hard drives, you know. And you think to yourself, you always have it, it's on a hard drive, but I've never gone back to any hard drive that I've saved, ever. And, and said, oh, let me dig this thing up. It's sort of like a high, high concept trash in a weird way, you know. It's like, a, it's like a trash with this weird sort of promise that you can still always get it, but you won't. And I realized I have nothing to prove that I've written the stuff that I've written. There's no, you can't see how I came up with this stuff. There's no, you can't touch it, you know. So I started saying, I just want documentation of my writing. Then I remember seeing like, uh, Don't Look Back, you know, that great, Pennebaker documentary on Bob Dylan and, and there's this scene where he's just sitting there, he's kind of playing the typewriter, you know. It's almost as much of a musical instrument as the harmonica or the guitar is for him and he's kind of in his own world and there's the requisite ashtray with a whole bunch of smoldering cigarettes in it. And I just sort of love the idea of like, even if you're Bob Dylan, you still have to sort of sit at this altar to sort of produce something. I said, I'm going to get myself a typewriter, you know, I'll see what that's all about. I got my typewriter at some online office superstore. They're like 120 bucks and you get everything in it. You plug and play and it's, it's ready to go. It just makes me think there's probably like four or five of them in the warehouse and every time they ship one out, it's like someone at Brother gets pissed off that they have to keep the service department open for that much longer because someone else bought one. I instantly started to really come alive on it. And I realized the reason that I was able to come alive on a typewriter where I wasn't using a computer or even a pen was that you're at sort of a safe distance where you can express yourself openly without having to edit yourself at the same time. And so it became this sort of like confessional for me where I would sit and just type. And the reason that I was able to go deeper into an idea was because I wasn't stopped anywhere in that writing by a red squiggly line and what is spell check or grammar check if all you're really trying to do is sort of dig into this sort of mercurial sort of world of what your ideas are? So if you're trying to say, you know, close your eyes and clone yourself, build your heart and army, and you spell army wrong, well, now you feel sort of obligated to fix the word army. And while you're fixing the word army, you've now completely lost the tack on being a wacko in what you're writing. So. What I would do is I would sit at my counter in my apartment in New York and I would type out three pages. Sometimes it would be before I went out, sometimes it'd be after I went out, and I never read them back until I got to the studio. If this were in Microsoft Word, I'd never see these again. All these uh, typed out lyrics, some of which made the records, obviously most of them which didn't, but you can see me sort of fighting for this song called Queen of California. When I die, I'm coming back as colors. The Queen of California is on the line. I got five free days and I, wait a minute, I got five free days before I go away. I hear the Queen of California needs a man to start a new life in the sun. I'm chasing the sun. I gotta find the Queen of California. I hear the Queen of California lives up there in the sun. It took a while to get it through. There's nothing she can do to me now. You know, it's like, and it's almost kind of um, artistic, sort of, even what it is, spelled completely wrong. It's, it's almost what thoughts look like, you know, the sort of stop and start of it. Uh, never as a man this alone felt this alive. Never as a man so alone felt so alive. It's like trying to get the wording. Never as a phone so dead at the side of my bed. <laughs> Have it charged in 36 hours. Searching for the sun that Neil Young hung after the gold rush in 71. A lyric that actually made it into Queen of California. They must have switched it for a different one because it's some new kind of digital light. Well, you know all stream of consciousness. And that's the thing, I can't get to stream of consciousness when I'm involved in my own editorial process as I'm trying to be a wacko. You know, I'm trying to be an absolute whack job when I'm typing. And it's like, the typewriter doesn't judge you, it just goes right away, sir. 
Right away, sir. However you want it to be. They do talk to you. You know, they talk to you. I didn't think a machine would talk to you, but they actually do. One of the odd things about the end of the 19th century is you have this 30-year period or so where all of the major forms of electromechanical media are invented you know, more or less at the same time. We get the final form of the typewriter, motion pictures, you get chemical photography, you get the phonograph, telegraphy, all of this stuff sort of happens at once. The other thing that was happening in America at that moment was there was this interest in spiritualism and seances and table tapping and poltergeists and all of those kinds of things. It's a moment in history when death is a lot more present than it is now. You could send a telegram to someone and you know it might take a couple of weeks to get to them and by the time they receive it, either you might be dead or they might be dead. It was a pretty natural question to ask, well, with all of these new forms of media, is there any way that we can receive communications from the dead? In a weird kind of way, typewriting is haunted. There's this sense that the writing somehow comes to you through the machine. Someone or something gives you something to type, and the machine kind of mediates it. Is the typewriter pulling the strings and making the author do the work? The typewriter has to be working almost before thinking starts happening. Once that process gets going, it's, it's like a little machine, you know, the, the writing comes out of it, but the, the question of cause and effect is a lot more tricky than you might first imagine. I don't ever feel nervous that the words won't come. Because I don't feel like I'm in control of it most of the time. I just trust there will be words that come, and thankfully there always have been, and I hope that it continues. I often think about what I do as counseling, because people come to me with some big stuff. I write a lot of poems about death and about people who've died. I wrote a poem for a man who had lost his wife three months ago, and they'd been married for 43 years. And when he made his request, he could barely talk. Somebody's desire for words sometimes is a desire for something more. A man had gone to the Golden Gate Bridge to jump and was saved by the police. And so he wanted me to write him a poem that was about his secret nobody in his life knew. I was so grateful to him for unloading it on me. If you were to ask me to speak a poem, I couldn't do it. But if you put me in front of a typewriter, it happens. It's like, maybe that's one of the reasons I also never allow anybody else to use this particular machine. My typewriter is like the truest love of my life. There's something about it that is so built well, and if you care for it, it's just gonna keep working. I do worry that someday there might not be somebody who knows how to fix it. Once a month, there's a flea market in Alameda at the old naval base. People come from all over the Bay Area. It's mostly antiques, and they have a ton of typewriters. Herb and I will go, and we're both looking for the same thing. How much is your typewriter? Mm -hmm. It's pretty. Yeah, not bad. How much is it? 75. Ah, yes, absolutely. I'm looking for typewriters that I can take apart. I had people stop by the shop, They're just hustlers, you know, had a bunch of typewriters and other stuff. They had like 15 Selectrics. If you need a couple more, uh, just to, All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've been turning them down, honestly. Herb's looking for something that he can make a little nicer or something that's already pretty immaculate. Nelsie Smith. 
and sold. So we help each other spot all the typewriters. Ooh, a clipper. We're both looking for a deal, which is harder to get these days because so many more people interested in typewriters than there were 10, 15 years ago. Exactly. How much? 75 for that clipper and that yeah. Underwood was... How much is that one? That was 68. I don't see many of those. I got about two or three of them already in line. <laughs> and where are those worth? Two, three hundred bucks, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, catch the right party, maybe you could go a little more than that. Put some rubber parts on it and a wash job on it. And uh, hey, yeah, if I get desperate and can't find anything else, I might come back to it. Ooh, how much your, uh, yes. Oh, okay, maybe we could negotiate a little bit like that on there. I've paid a lot for it out of a shop. You know anything about whether it works or not? Yeah, definitely needs some attention. <laughs> Take it. That's a good one. Uh, had it been any other color but red, I'd have passed right by it for 150. I guarantee you that. Red is sort of a hot color, and it's a easy, easy mover, so to speak. There. It's rock and roll. Yeah, no, I feel something for these machines. I'll look at them and, and my mind just goes, where, where's this machine been at? If we could talk, man, could it tell some stories? You never know where these typewriters come from. You know, they come from all over the world. You know, one could have been in, you know, some famous person's library somewhere halfway across the world. And now it made it to this shop over here in Berkeley. Christopher Lathan Scholes was a very interesting man. He was an editor, a publisher, and for a while he was a state senator. He was also a keen inventor. And in Milwaukee, a few years after the Civil War, he invented his typewriter. Excuse me, sir, can I ask you a question? I'm looking for the location of the historical plaque that uh, talks about the invention of the typewriter, somewhere nearby, I believe. At 318 State Street, approximately 300 feet northeast of here, Christopher Lathan Scholes perfected the first practical typewriter in September 1869 in the machine shop of C.S. Kleinstuber. Three hundred feet northeast of here. I've come to Milwaukee to get my hands on a Scholes and Glidden. To be able to get close to the source of the very first typewriter is something I've dreamed about for a long time. Today, perhaps, there are only 175 that are known to exist. Good morning. So nice to meet you. Hi, it's wonderful. You, Hello. Many I'm of those are in museums. A few are held in, in private hands. This has been a, a pilgrimage I've, I've wanted to make for years. I would love to be able to have one of these typewriters in my own collection. Oh, I want one of those. I want one of those, Al. To be able to 
explore it. I've been in the museum since uh, probably just after World War I. And really have a sense that my collection has become complete at that point, even though I don't have all the typewriters, but that would really give me a sense of completion. Many efforts had been made since the 1700s by various inventors to create a typewriting machine, but they all ended in failure with very few being produced. But Christopher Lathan Scholz's place in history is marked by what he did in Kleinstuber's machine shop beginning in 1867 and the six difficult years that followed to create the world's first commercially successful typewriter. The initial efforts used a piano type keyboard. What you're really kind of looking at here is just a man's ideas and how to get the mechanics of the fingers making type to the mechanics of getting it on a piece of paper. The lower is the back half of the alphabet and the upper keys would have been the front half of the alphabet. Scholes and his team made around 50 to 60 prototypes and at the end of those six years he ended up with a working wooden typewriter. Is this written by Scholes? It is from Scholes. Wow. A touching, written. touching history here. I think the machine is now as perfect in its mechanism as I know how to make it. I know of no respect in which I can improve it. The machine is done and I want some more worlds to conquer. Life will be most flat, stale, and unprofitable without something to invent. Yours, etc., Shoals. The wooden prototype met with rejection right away. They took it to half a dozen different manufacturers, whom all declined to manufacture the typewriter. Then someone suggested that they take the typewriter to Remington & Sons. Now, Remington & Sons had been making weaponry for the Civil War, and with the Civil War over, they were looking for new things to manufacture. Remington & Sons took this wooden prototype, and they spent the next year turning it into a metal machine that was much more reliable and durable and could be mass-produced by them. And the first Scholes & Glidden typewriters appeared on the market in 1874. May I push a key and get a feel. I've never done this before, by give the way. It. I've never actually pushed a key on a Scholes and Glidden. Yes, give it, give it a try. Is that, that's fine. I'm gonna push the J there. That's wonderful. $125 was a lot of money to put out for this machine, especially as nobody could type and nobody knew the benefits of what a typewriter could offer. Of great significance was the appearance of the first QWERTY keyboard on this Scholes and Glidden typewriter. If you look at the keyboard, the top row left to right says QWERTY. There is endless debate about how that order came into being. Some say that all of the letters in the word typewriter are on the first line of keys. So a salesman who was trying to demonstrate the benefits of this wonderful new machine to prospective customers could whack out the word typewriter very, very quickly without having to be particularly proficient. When the Scholes and Glidden came out, it was not well received. People didn't understand what typewriter could offer. They only sold a thousand units. Scholes was very disappointed and he sold all his remaining shares in the company. The Remington II typewriter coming out in 1878 was really the turning point for this revolutionary machine. Within a few short years, all hell would break loose. By the mid-1890s, there were as many as 60 typewriter manufacturers, not just in America, but also in Europe, and the sales had taken off. Two royals, the last of them. Most of the machines that we repair are approximately 40 to 50 years old. The companies that made the machines and supplied the parts, they are long gone. AIM Supply Company was the last of the companies that supplied us with parts for a lot of the typewriters. Their primary thing was to take old typewriter plans and recover them, resurface them. We got a letter last week saying that after 110 years in operation, AIM Supply Company was going out of business. My dad, he's very good at solving problems. Yeah. And then he could look at it and figure it out and solve it within minutes. And that's something you got to appreciate with my father, that you just don't find that nowadays. It's a lost art. It's uh, about the right 
consistency that's actually pretty close in diameter on it. Pops, he, he loves all this. This is, has been his life ever since I was born, and he stayed with it. Yeah, it's like 9.5 right from me. He told me, if you're going to do something, do it all the way, but make sure you enjoy it. Like, don't have anything. Go 100%. And make sure you like what you're doing. See if you can slide that one in there. Yeah, I'll, no I'll just slide easier. Go ahead and get the carpet. And he showed me that. A little uh, soap on that. Man. I'm here trying to help my dad out, man. You get that? Oh, yeah, that's going on in there. And grind it. I think what the typewriter symbolizes to me is America. My work. America hard work. What this country was based on. Made by us with our own hands to help us out, but not to spoil us and not to make us complacent. I think that much of the joy of life can come and should come from work. I think we've been sold a certain bill of goods about ease and happiness being necessarily synonymous. They aren't. Something goes out of the human experience when life is made progressively easier, less complicated, less demanding of alertness, effort, and appreciation of work when it's done. There was once a typewriter that was standing alone on a shelf in an old store in White Plains, New York, nobody paying much attention to it at all. That's the beginning of the story. Then along came. In 1965, when I was starting to work on my first book, feeling that I needed something more substantial to work on than a portable typewriter, I went and bought a secondhand Royal Standard typewriter. and. I probably paid $25 for it. Got it in White Plains, New York, and I've been using it all these years, almost every day, written everything I have written on it, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's a magnificent example of superb American manufacturing. People tell me that I could do, do much better, I could go faster and have less to contend with if I were to use a computer, a word processor. But I don't want to go faster. If anything, I would prefer to go slower. To me, it's understandable. I press the key, and another key comes up and prints a letter on a piece of paper. And then you can pull it out. It's a piece of paper upon which you have printed something. You've made that. It's tangible. It's real. I think the tool of the typewriter, because it is more difficult, produces for me a better result. I work virtually all day, every day. I come out after breakfast and I work until lunchtime and then I go in, get a bite to eat, come back out, work for the rest of the day. Now I'm not typing, not writing on the typewriter all that time. If you were to walk by in the field behind there and you looked in the window, you'd think, well, that guy's just sitting in there daydreaming. But an awful lot of the process is just thinking. There are a lot of fractals in nature, mysterious geometry that exists in everything. I see the same shapes inside the typewriter. I like to pull out the shapes that I feel resemble parts of the anatomy. Sometimes a part dictates that it be surface anatomy. Sometimes it's a, a bone, you know, skeletal anatomy. Sometimes it's a little mixture of both. When I take the typewriters apart, I don't see this unnatural object. But I see people, I see us in them. Very often near the platen knobs, there's a spot where someone's finger has rubbed across the carriage. And it's this one nice and shiny polished spot with a little bit of dirt and oil from the fingers. 
I like that kind of uh, thing that's left on the typewriter. I, I could say that there's probably that person's DNA. It's fun to see those traces of people. It's such an emotional machine. A lot of memories and a lot of real people put themselves onto a piece of paper through the machine. And I understand all that. This is how I choose to appreciate the typewriter, by dissecting it and bringing out the little bits and pieces that are us in them. So my favorite stuff to do is, is the human figures because I find every curve on the human body in here somewhere, in one of these typewriters. And I like to try to put those together. I do that with pins and springs and nuts. I don't use anything apart from what's in the typewriter. I've learned how to match the parts to the corresponding part in the human body just by, you know, play. I'm putting the parts together and, oh, you look like a, a leg, or, you know, a, a very childlike way of just having a dialogue with the parts. I grew up in northern Minnesota on the Mesabi Iron Range. I lived in a lot of trailers. Yeah, my dad never made a lot of money. He never had any desire to buy a house. I left there probably two days after I graduated. I wanted to get out. And now I'm in a trailer again. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. As a kid, deer were everywhere. There were times when my dad was laid off from the railroad and we were eating Campbell's soup peanut butter from the jar, and venison. When I moved down to Oakland, one of the first sculptures I made was the deer. I'd always told myself I wouldn't make one. I've taken this deer across the Bay Bridge about six times back and forth. I've shown it at galleries art exhibitions. I don't like for work to sit around and taunt me with the, the failure of not being able to sell it. Uh, I'm a bit ambivalent about the, the whole gallery scene. Trying to work as an artist and then sell my work through a gallery has been exceedingly difficult. It's hard to take a piece that I've worked on for maybe as much as a year to sell it for not a lot of money and then only to get half of that not a lot of money. So just two weeks? Oh, okay. The best way for me to do this for a living is to take on the promotion myself. And the internet makes it really easy. You know, it just takes me a couple hours a day. I have just about every social networking profile that you can imagine. I try to show a little what the studio looks like every day the images of my process while I'm working on a piece. People can email me directly and I manage to get enough work to almost pay the bills. When I was a kid, about uh, 19, 20 years old, got a job working in Berkeley. It's like the whole world opened up to me over here different kind of people, different kind of cultures. I really found myself wanting to go to work every day. It lets you see the world without going to see the world. You know, the world comes to you in this city over here. First time I heard a black guy with a British accent, it blew me away. open five days a week, 12 to 5. A couple years ago, it was only open three days a week. It's picking up, but it's just not there yet. It's uh, just enough to keep us going, but not enough to keep me going. <laughs> I'm just hoping that things will turn around. 
Herb and I, we have the skills, the experience, we have all the knowledge of doing this. We just need customers. Wait, 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 on it. Mine is you broke the ribbon. No, I didn't. Yeah? I was already ripped like that. One good thing about them is that you don't have to turn them on or plug them in. I used to have a PC, but I did not like my PC one bit. There is a wonderful way to spend time typing. You get to think about it. You get to romantically sit back and ponder what your next words are going to be, and that is a pleasant, tactile action. It actually turns writing or composing into a, a very specific physical process that has a soundtrack to it. Listen to this one. See, hear that heavy chunk that you hear right there? Smith Corona now. A little muted, a little softer. And now hear the Olympia. Chris, a little solid report that, that comes out that to me is a good, solid, good, solid work of art. It's really exciting to come into a shop where you know you're surrounded by all these great typewriters and and you know your your mind reels at, at the different sounds that they can make. Certain typewriters you may discover sounds that you never heard before. It's hard to find a typewriter with good bell tone. This bell isn't the loudest, but it's got the it's got the best tone to it. This one the the whole case is it it doesn't, uh, it doesn't articulate on a lever. On better typewriters, that bell should be loud, it should be clear. Now this one, the bell is kind of a more thuddy sound. This one, it's, uh, it rings really loudly. This one has the best bell of them all. It's hard to find a typewriter where it's a quality sound and it can be consistently made. We are the Boston Typewriter Orchestra, and we perform music uh, on old typewriters, old discarded typewriters. We're a collective, and what a shitty answer that was. One of the things we sat down pretty early with in the, uh, in the BTO and decided was that none of us were going to try and quit our day jobs to, uh, to make the BTO work as a, uh, a legitimate band. And that was sort of a really liberating decision. You know, make, an, make enough money to keep us in typewriters, beer, the occasional pizza. We don't want to destroy these. You know, we want to, we are using them as an instrument. We are repurposing it, but our intent is not to destroy it. I murdered one and I have to find a new typewriter. You feel like uh, Pete Townsend, I guess, you know, he destroyed the guitar, he's like, shit, we better get signed fast so, so I can have another guitar to destroy. I mean, I've, I've killed three typewriters now, each one of them has its own personality and spirit and soul. We had the, the two Smith Coronas that had a really nice case slide on oh, them. Oh, God, yeah. And those two have since you know, become inoperable in pieces. And there's an entire song that we can't play now because we haven't been able to, uh, to restock those two typewriters so that specific mechanics of the case slide. We spend a lot of time really crafting all of our songs. And we have, we do some covers. We send up uh, Gil Scott Heron's uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised and it's now The Revolution Will Be Typewritten and we do a cover of... We're working on a cover of Rain and Blood. <clears throat> That's Slayer. I was uh, at somebody's house years and years ago and saw framed on the wall a thank you note that Noel Coward had written to somebody he had had lunch with. 
and this was in 1930-something. And I thought, okay, Noel Coward actually typed that on his typewriter and sent it to somebody, and it's been lingered around, and then somebody bought it at some auction or something like that. But that piece of paper is still with us. And I think that that is, it, it, deep down inside, is the interest that I have in it. Anybody with one of these can create a document that will physically last forever. And if the idea on it is a good one, the idea can last forever too. Everybody knows the feeling of having lost digital data. Nothing is worse than losing digital data as a writer. I've never lost something I've typed. Ten years from now, is any of the computers going to read the stuff that we've saved? I have no idea. But this is still, this is still absolutely human compliant. It's human compatible. You don't have to upgrade to look at it. You just have to make sure it doesn't light on fire. That's all you have to do. I type over everything. I don't bother with whiteout. I don't bother, I don't, I don't try to correct it. I don't make multiple drafts. If I make a mistake, I just, it will maybe exit out like that. I think there's a great value in mistakes. It's their value for history of how things are made. You see the perfect finished text of a speech that a president of the United States makes. How much editing did the president do on that? How much of the speech was not written by him? Which words they changed? Which sentences they crossed out? That's extremely interesting. You see the process of what it took to get to the finished result. With a computer, no manuscripts like that will be around anymore. Future historians are going to have nothing to work with. There will be no diaries, there will be no letters. So how will we know what they really thought, how their minds were working, what the processes were? As the benefits of this revolutionary machine became clear, there was a real shortage of trained typists. People did not know how to operate them efficiently. The first typing school ever opened in New York in 1881, and it was at the YWCA. There were six women enrolled, and it was a six-month class. Every woman who was trained to type got a job immediately. The typewriter was what the typist was called, so the woman was the typewriter. And there was this huge groundswell for the first time, women entering into the man's business environment. They were paid less than men, but it was still a larger salary than they had been paid when they worked in factories or as a school teacher. Scholes didn't get any financial gain from success when it came, but he was very satisfied that his invention had provided new opportunities for women. He saw it as a means of emancipating women and getting them into the workplace in a new capacity. If I could time travel, I'd love to go back to Klein Stuber's machine shop and to see Scholes, I mean, to actually see him there, a breathing, living man. If I could have spoken to Scholes, I would have shook his hand, I'd want to feel his palm in my palm. I'd look him in the eyes, see his face alive, not just a photograph. I'm not too sure what I'd say. There'd perhaps be tears in my eyes. I would suggest that we have a beer together. I'd want to tell Scholes a bit about what the 20th century was like. I'd want to tell him a bit about the computer, the personal computer. I'd want to tell Scholes that the QWERTY keyboard was still there, and it never changed. When typewriter manufacturers were designing the typewriter, they wanted to make something sexy, create something that people could relate to and want to put their fingers on. I dreamed about creating a woman, like a full-scale nude woman for a long time something archetypal, something that would show the sensuality, the curves, and the lines that I found in the typewriter parts. Yeah, but not unnaturally. It's very difficult to put things together in a way that emulates real life. Just the right size. It's too short. In trying to create her beauty, 
It's helping me bring out the forms in the typewriter that I think are the most beautiful and most sensual. I used a bell and a platen knob for the lips because it has little vertical lines that look like the cracks in the lips. Two of the ribbon spool covers from a royal get set up as the pelvis. One of the sexiest lines is the curve of the pectoral muscle just above the breast. And that exists in a lot of typewriters. Royals have those, Olympia, Underwoods. They're suggesting breasts. When I'm in the thick of creating, my body disappears, physical pain disappears. And it's very meditative in that uh, I'm not thinking about the bills I have to pay or what day of the week it is. I give that trance state more time in my life than any other time. Any money that I've made doing this, that's what that all pays for, is that time for me, being in that state. When I hit those trances, it's a very strange combination of laying the pavement and driving on it. You're seeing a phenomenon. You're seeing this apparition take place. I don't mean to sound hocus pocus about it, but there's something taking place, and you're true to that. And you cannot decide when those moments are gonna be. You just have to be there in case they happen. But you have to keep your heart rate down and focus and stay in that trance and just let that one side of your brain create and the other side of your brain send it through. And sometimes you see it by leaps and bounds. Sometimes you it's just, it's static. You don't just write it, you see it. You know. The best creators in the world are fiercely arrogant. And it's not the arrogance that you normally think of. It's the arrogance in looking at something you haven't created yet and say, yes, I have. Sometimes it leads you somewhere and sometimes it doesn't. You know? But uh, that's the adventure of it. You, know? you create something so you don't have to live with the reality that you couldn't create something. It's sick, it's a very sick process. I'm going to create something just so I don't have nothing. Doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. I heard put the building up for sale. And uh, I didn't want to see him do it. I mean, he struggled a lot to keep it going. And to see him put it up for sale, I was kind of sad for it. We haven't heard anything since the sign's been put up. But just a couple of days ago, I got an inquiry from a prospective buyer. After they left, I talked to Herb, and uh, he seems to think that the guy is probably quite interested in it. And if the shop gets sold, then uh, I've got to find something else to do. So I'm kind of waiting to see what my next move is going to be. I can't make a move until they make one. Dad mentioned oh, that he was yeah. a little concerned about Kenny. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, we're only... have to give severance or something. Oh, definitely. We'd have to give sure. him something. Yeah. yeah, some kind of package for sure. Absolutely. And some kind and, of time. And, 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 I mean, some kind of warning. I mean, not 30 days, 60 days. I well, mean, as long as it comes with a reasonable have. check, it should help soften that blow. We pay him not enough probably for what we get from That's him, right. I think. Yeah. That's right. For what he takes on and does for us. We're doing I think we owe him too. something. What would you think? 15 years he's been working for you. No. And 30 days notice? No. And no, no check? No. I'm not, no. I'm not feeling no. that. No way. Dude, I mean, he's, he's going to go out and find a job now. He's made it possible for Dad to be not there all the time and Carmen to not be there all the time, actually. He would drop whatever he's doing to come help Dad. Today's Herb's 70th birthday. I fixed up a couple of classic royals that uh, they're going to use to have people sign in. A lot of people are from Herb's past. Hey, remember the we used to do? <laughs> IBM days, his old typewriter days. I think he's going to have a good time. As we celebrate 70 years of life, amen. I want to share one thing. God had given us two commandments. One is to love him with everything that we have. And the second is to love our neighbor, which includes family and friends. It's obvious that you love family and friends because you're here tonight. 
And so I want to give a toast to Herbert Vermillion III for touching so many lives. Happy birthday. Hey, hey, 70 hey. years of life. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to You know, people do have to go to work. You know, I can't sit here and pet you all afternoon. It's, it's rough right now. Yeah, it's definitely rough. You'll be all right. I like what I do. It's just unfortunate that it's just not enough to where I can uh, make a decent living off of it. You know, I'm a, I'm a proud man, you know. I, I like to work for my own and get my own and take care of my family. And, uh, and have my family be proud of me. That's the main thing. And, I'm, and I know they are, you know, my boys are. You know, I was taught never to give up, you know. I'm never gonna give up. I'll never, I'll never just throw in the towel. I'm gonna always keep trying, you know. I owe that to my parents. You know, they were hardworking people. They came to California back in the 40s to work in these shipyards out here. And, you know, they sacrificed a lot. They did a lot to raise nine kids. And, you know, so I owe it to them not to slouch off or be a bump. They worked hard and, you know, I patterned my life after them. You know, and I want my sons to pattern theirs after me somewhat. So, got to keep going. Got to keep going. Always going to keep going. That thing's going to probably hit right in the middle. Uh, I've been collecting for 25 years now. And I realize that I'll never shake this obsession. I've come to San Francisco to see a collector who has one of the greatest collections of shoals and glidens. Jim Rowan has amassed what is arguably the biggest collection of these machines. He has 12 of them. Wow. I am the kid in the candy store. I've never really used my typewriters. No, that's... Uh... I've just preserved them. That's good. That's the important thing. It's much harder now to find a Scholes and Glidden typewriter in the wild. This is Scholes and Glidden 2540. Oh, this is exquisite. I've only been collecting for half the time that Jim has. He started collecting 50 years ago, and at that time there were only a handful of typewriter collectors. 3026. Oh, that is a gorgeous machine. Oh, that's... you'll love that one. And that should do it except for those yes. two. Oh, boy, I used to have your energy. I shall take off my wedding ring. Is your wife into typewriters at all, Martin? Uh, in a word, uh, no. Oh, my, those are shiny and beautiful. Wow. I think I got so more shots of Bloodens than the Smithsonian does. Wow, look at that, eh? It's always rather a personal question to ask a collector if they have a particular machine for sale. Are you still looking for Shoals and Glidden's? I guess certainly if you saw one, you'd... Well, I don't know now whether so many things uh, economy-wise have changed for us. Difficult times. But as collectors, we all sort of have to put our hat into the ring and, and, and make our desires known it's it's important not to be too meek i suspect that over the years you've had other collectors who have come to you uh interested in buying a shoals and glidden typewriter from you has that been the case yes let me ask you this what are your thoughts about selling some of your typewriters at this right time right now i seriously you know really don't have any plans for selling them now and um, there's still more research I'd like to do and have the machines for. I understand that. I understand. I'd love to see the collection preserved in a museum of some type, mechanical museum, maybe even a typewriter museum. It's very nice. I, I would come and visit that museum. Oh, I'd love to have you. 
I dreamed of this moment for a long time to be sitting and looking at a Scholes and Glidden typewriter and knowing it was mine. My hunt will continue. I love connecting to the past, and yet the past is so elusive. My typewriter room has some trappings from my youth. It's got a fire engine that I had when I was six years old, and I've got some wind-up toys that my mother used to bring back to us from Germany. I have a twin brother. I'll give you my, my only twin joke now. You know what twins are? They're womb mates. That's my dad and mother. I first experienced collecting from my parents, collecting these interesting tools. My dad would restore them. Cobbler's tools, Cooper's tools, kitchen implements. It's an electric comb. This is our house. My parents still have that house that we moved into in 1966. There was the Don River in the back garden. We'd build boats, we'd get a door and put walls around it and we'd go floating it on the river. We had annual Lamros, pretty grand barbecues. It was a real party house. This is a pulley ride down the back garden. She's 85 years old. My dad built a zip line 300 feet long from the top right down to the pine trees at the bottom of the hill. And this is a massive teeter-totter my dad built with a universal joint in the middle, a sort of carnival ride. We built balsa wood gliders. That's an eight foot wingspan on that one. I am capturing my past. It's there with me, the past, my, my room, my playroom, it's still with me and um, I'm very happy to have them with me in this room now. I love to chase the past and to capture it the best I can. The past is a luxurious pursuit, which I've, I've luckily been able to indulge to some extent. sold some work. A tech CEO from Silicon Valley had seen the deer and wanted it. He contacted me and asked me to install it in his apartment in San Francisco while he was away. It was really good timing. Just paying people who owe money already. And then money's all gone, but it allows me to move forward a little bit. I was happy someone appreciated it. And that was what I dreamed about when I moved from the mountains to the city, was that at some point, I'd be installing my work in a really nice apartment with a beautiful view, and that my work meant something to someone. Bruce Sterling, the science fiction author, posted something on Wired.com about my work. And then Cory Doctorow started posting stuff of mine on Boing Boing. After that, I got picked up by Popular Mechanics, Gizmodo, Engadget, a lot of the tech blogs. Things started to pick up very quickly. How many of you recognize this sound? What is it? I started getting calls from people in Silicon Valley. How many of you actually learned how to type on a typewriter? High-tech people creating new You're technologies old. who were interested in buying my work. This piece is a portrait bust of Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook. Christmas present for him from a friend. Hopefully it looks a little like him. Mark's eyes are kind of a little wide set. The insides of his eyes are kind of turned up a little bit. Sometimes I'll get anonymous hate mails on my website or comments on Instagram or Facebook. 
where someone's obviously very upset. And I'm doing what I do. They'd rather see the typewriter live than have me make my crappy artwork or whatever. They want to save every typewriter. And that's just not possible. It's not practical. And it's not going to happen. This is the way that I honor them. I'd much rather see them in this state than sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Technology will change us. We won't be human in the same way. We'll be a different kind of human. This piece is called Thea. She's a Greek goddess of sight and light. It's for Oculus VR, a company that makes a virtual reality headset called the Oculus Rift. That's technology that I've been waiting for since I was a little kid, along with the flying car and all that other stuff. This is going to be hanging from cables in their office. In the near future, there's going to be a huge split in society. There'll be one group who will have all the money and power to change their DNA, augment their bodies with technology, and become machines that can live forever. And then there will be the other group who will reject all that for a completely analog life. Living in nature with little or no technology and trying to stay human. When I was a kid, I liked everything in the future. I watched it, the Jetsons. I liked Johnny Quest, you know, because he had technology. I loved it. I wanted to be Haji. But I'm an adult now, and now I see what it's really doing to us. You know, we had plants full of workers. Now they're full of robots. Sometimes we forget about what happens when we do have these innovations and, and, and the fallout effect from that. Are you at a loss as a culture if something dies and nobody appreciates the death of it. Maybe, maybe not. It's like time traveling when you come in here looking at one of these machines. I think they take you back in, in a place in time. You can visualize what was happening in the 40s or World War I or the 60s, if you will, just by the typewriters that we work on here and the era that they came out in. So I'm praying to God that we can keep this thing going. So, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I hope there's a lot of enthusiasts still out there, you know, that want their machines fixed. And yeah, I can do it. I mean, I'm not bragging, but I'm damn good. I am. I am. No brag, just fact. Let's get this one here. Individually, I think we are a culture. You know, individually. Every individual is a culture, you know. But the big picture of the culture doesn't make any sense to me. You know? Oh, yeah. During Christmas time, we probably do our best work. When they come in the shop, it's very nostalgic to them. The typewriter invokes a sense of, of times gone that were, I think, a lot less stressful. Time machines. I think there's enough people out there that can keep us afloat. But I don't know. I don't know. You're not getting the eye. Look, are you? Looks kind of sport sun out like I need it. That looks okay. That one maybe should go on the other That's side. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that can go over there. Yeah. yeah. Put that over there. Typewriters are a so-called thing of the past, so. People sometimes turn to them in an attempt to recapture the past. How are we looking? How are we looking? I think it looks good. I think it looks way better. It's a way to travel back in time to a previous period in history. 
I've come to see typewriters less as objects of nostalgia than signs of a future, signs of something that's going to happen. There's a slow movement afoot. People realizing that not everything has to be completely efficient, not everything has to be goal-oriented, but you can enjoy the process itself. You could compare typing to the slow cooking movement. The point is not to eat as efficiently as possible, the point is to take your time. And efficiency is not the paramount value, the point is to enjoy what you're doing. Great that you can talk to your own friends, but how do we take that video calling experience and really make it social? And in fact, you can only video call with people who've already accepted your friend request. Computers, they're great tools, but they're also seductive and they take away some of our power sometimes. It's gonna be a one-click toggle to change between these modes. There's a fine line between having something help you and having you be dependent on it. We have facial detection, which actually tells you if someone's home. You have face alerts. If someone walks into the living room, you would receive a face alert. I don't want to find out tomorrow what happened today. I want to find out within seconds or microseconds if possible. Social media allows everyone to know everything about everyone. We have it a little accelerometer inside the sensor. You're actually going to get a vibration to let you know to stand up straight. And it takes all your data points. And then the real secret sauce is where our engineers have made all the algorithms that take all this data and actually turn it into insights and information. There'll be always those people who are against it, but I think for the most part people will start to come around to it. I was having this rebellious moment, this feeling of being sick of the digital world, how intrusive it is, how pesky it is, how invasive it is, and I went to my typewriter and wrote down a manifesto. We assert our right to resist the paradigm, to rebel against the information regime, to escape the data stream. We strike a blow for self-reliance, privacy, and coherence against dependency, surveillance, and disintegration. We affirm the written word and written thought against multimedia, multitasking, and the meme. We choose the real over representation, the physical over the digital, the durable over the unsustainable, the self-sufficient over the efficient. After I wrote it, I put it through the scanner and shared it online. Then I put a little note on my blog saying, Psst, visit this website where you could find it, and people did. They started copying it, retyping it, sharing it. Here's somebody who translated it into Italian. Here's a translation into Serbian. Then in a few weeks, I started getting postcards, letters in my mailbox from the insurgency around the world. The revolution reached the village of Graubünden, located in a southern valley, Agent Neckerman, Jr. Greetings from the insurrection. We are pleased to inform you that typewriters are now mandatory in every tower and minaret east of Paris. Unfortunately, it was not a bloodless coup. Sometimes the unenlightened must be shown the error of their wicked ways. We are confident that every public building in every hamlet, village, and city will soon resonate with the glorious clatter of type bars falling upon paper. It is never too late to experience the joys of our mechanical friends. Freedom must always be freedom for those who think differently. Rosa Luxemburg. Comrade Polt, this month I visit a foreign country where I hope to make contact with the new cell of the insurgency. Workers of the typosphere unite. This one came in recently from Alabama. This dispatch comes from the province known among the cognoscenti as the Magic City. Natives here express satisfaction at the recent contact with the glorious revolutionaries of the London Town Directorate and hold themselves in readiness for further instructions from the Polt Bureau. Vive l'insurgency! Communique ends. From Melbourne, Australia. Typewriter writers of Melbourne, unite. Bring out your weapons of writing and write in the streets, in the parks, at the football. Write like every word matters. 
we watch our movement grow stronger every day, the revolution will be typewritten. Sometimes I feel homesick for a place I can never really get back to. My father died last June. He was 86. Eventually, the house will have to be sold. The house was the house that people came to to play. It was where my friends came. It was, it was the adventure playground. I can see myself in 10, 15, 20 years walking along the river and approaching my parents' house from the valley. I'll come down here and imagine the pleasures of childhood that were had here. Uh, something to drink here? Yeah, lemonade. Uh, medium. Oh, okay. What's up? Right here good? Yeah, okay. that's fine. <laughs> Herb decided not to take the offer on the building. He decided, well, let's just not give up hope yet on it. Let's see if we can keep this thing going. We realized we needed a website. The whole typewriter thing seems to be a fad right now, but I think it's more than that. All these kids out there wanting typewriters, the only way they're going to see that is online. It seems funny that the only way that California typewriter will be able to survive is by embracing new technology, using social networking and a website just to tell people that they exist. Here it is, update. Okay. It's gonna, it's gonna say update on your... Main, it's right. It's way easier on the app. They can manage their promotion yeah, good. through the web. I just took a great picture of the case over there and then I'm gonna do like a Instagram post that says something. You know, they won't have to wait for anybody to come into their store anymore. Here, I'm gonna say this is super clean, little beauty. They can arrange repairs and ship typewriters. 440? Uh, yeah, 440. And they could stay in that space, happy there, and the whole family keeps working together, and you still got that Valentine. It'd be great. Right now, the site just pretty much features profiles of the store and of the employees in it, and what we do, and how long we've been here. And it features a few machines, but it certainly has to grow bigger than that. You know, one thing about the new technology is that even though we may hate it, we need it. <laughs> I'm glad you can make it. That's fine, that's fine. Okay. First of all, we want to thank you guys for coming. This is uh, our first type in. This place hasn't been bumping like this in a while, so yeah. welcome and thank you for coming. The basic service runs about 75 and Okay. Ribbon's about 15 bucks. Uh, give me a name and a phone number to call I We're, we're all a little weird, you know, when you have an addiction and you find other like-minded people, this whole group of people enabling each other. I thought it was a good opportunity to come and meet lots of other people who bother with typewriters. I'm worse than Alcoholic Anonymous. <laughs> Somebody come up with a creative word for typewriter anonymous and I'm that. My name is Tony Midling and I have a typewriter problem. So I have a typewriter problem too and I love it. I think there's actually a lot of people who fit the description of high tech people who've kind of had enough and have gone back to the analog world. I actually work for Facebook which is really interesting to me because I spend all of my time online uh, social networking. I think a lot of people want get, to get away from that and withdraw from that. Um, even young people and I think that's why they're attracted to technology like this. This is there's never going to be a typewriter movement. You know, it's just about instead of there being this one massive way of thinking, there are many, many smaller, more niche sort of ways of being, which would be great to have again. Hi, I'm Mike. And, and bringing back this village by way of different neighborhoods. These, these, these guys, they're on the typewriter and they're naturalists. You know, you're going to see a group of people grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Oh, we can do it again every year. <laughs> That's it. All right. <laughs>
Uh, see, typewriter keys represent the keys of life. And we human beings dance on them. And then when we dance, as we press down the keys of the machine, the story that's written is the story of our fate. It's very symbolic. Thank you. Typewriter really isn't dead. It's still getting used. In India, at least. Typewriter tip 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 karta hai. Zindagi ki har kahani likta hai. There are these info slums, places where people type for a living on the street. Not for creative purposes, not for writing poems or for writing novels, but for business purposes. It was recently announced that the last typewriter manufacturing plant was closing down. The last typewriter manufacturer on earth has shut down. The factory was in Mumbai, India. The company was 60 years old. It opened in the time of Nehru. Godridge and Boyce stopped their typewriter manufacturing about three years ago. They sold tens of thousands of typewriters every year until the typewriter was just killed off by the computer. Godridge brought me here to create sculptures from the last 100 typewriters that rolled off their assembly line. I don't know what I'm going to make yet. Godridge wanted the sculpture to be a symbol of their commitment to innovation, to represent their move into the 21st century. The lotus, it rises from the filth, from the murky water at the bottom of the pond. And, and blossoms into this pure, uncontaminated, delicate flower. A symbol of enlightenment, rebirth, perfection, something beautiful growing from the bottom of a dirty pond. There's no such thing as permanence. Things die and the reborn is something new. I don't want to look back. The future is the only thing that you can do anything about. You can't do anything but the past. A lot of people are really scared about how the future is unfolding, and the only way to think about it is to be optimistic. We're going to do amazing things with technology. We have to. The thing that people who are afraid of change should remember is that people born after you aren't living your time. They don't want what you want. They want what's in their time. You can't stop that habit that people have of taking knowledge and trying to tweak the world around us with it. We're always going to do that. I don't know what the future holds for me. I'm doing what I love and I'm doing what I want. I don't know where I'm gonna be six months from now. I remember when I told my wife that I'd had my first typewriter dream. She was quite alarmed. I'm looking in a big glass window of a store. It's nighttime. They're closed, and I look in and I see shelves. And on the shelves are wonderful early typewriters, rare ones, unusual ones, ones I've never seen before. And my eyes dance along the shelves, checking out these treasures. But I can't get in, the door's locked. Sometimes I'm actually transported into the store, and I get to get really close to the shelves. I never touch the typewriters, I can never touch them, but I get close. That's as far as it goes. I have no idea what the life of this typewriter was before I had the privilege of possessing it, nor do I have any idea what will become of it when my turn is over. 
I'd like to think it will stay in our family and maybe there'll be grandchildren a bit want to write and maybe one or two of them might be peculiar enough to enjoy that this as much as their grandfather did. Hello. Hi, my gosh. Alan, yeah. Martin, hi. Yeah. I, we've met before, I think. We've talked on the phone. We have. Oh, well, we, we haven't got, met. We've got catching up to do. There's typewriters in these hills, eh? Hi. Canadian boy. Oh. This year, there's a gathering of antique typewriter collectors in Morgantown, West Virginia, at Herman Price's house. Have you seen his Manhattan paper table? Just, no? It's like the Mona Lisa. Oh, come, come. Herman Price, his whole basement is a labyrinth of rooms and corridors. The typewriters are stacked on shelves from the floor right up to the ceiling. Anybody come from 2,000 miles? I mean, 3,000 miles, 4,000, miles, and the winner is Marty Wrights. Come on up here, Marty. I have a lot of typewriters. It's approximately 700. Marty is from outer space. And I found that collecting the typewriter friends is a lot more fun than collecting the typewriters. This is a white mall number three. There's a full range of ages here, from 14, the youngest, up to 75, approaching 80. And it's just a fun machine that makes you smile to look at it. Mostly men, all men. Very strange, I don't know why that is. I take it back with me in the hotel, I sleep with her tonight, and then I'll take it back tomorrow. All right, so this is my Oliver Woodstock. Absolutely no relation. It's just wonderful to share a passion of early typewriters. Yeah. Do you have to do much to it, or was it like that when you got it? Uh, I'll never be able to get all the antique typewriters. It's spectacular. There's always going to be people out there with bigger collections. If I had to keep only one typewriter, if I had to get rid of them all, and only have one left, There is a version of this Smith Corona, which is the silent Smith Corona. And um, the, the, uh, I have a, an electric version of this, which is actually kind of like a hybrid model of it, because only, the only thing in it that is electric is the keys. But there is, you know, let me move this. Smith Corona Skyrider, definitely on the top five list. If you can only take five typewriters with you, that would be it. Hermes 2000, definitely might want to might take that bad boy. <clears throat> the Olympia is okay, but quite frankly, the rise of the keys is a little too high. Somewhere around whenever they started making this, the Smith Corona Silent and various other models that have the same silhouette, the rise on the keys is just almost perfect. Going from an N to a Y requires almost nothing. The size of the type is not too big and not too small. But listen to, the, listen to the solidity of the action. This is a solid, solid piece of machine. It's got beautiful like highlights, like the stripes here and there. The colors are good. I love the green keys. I would probably say that this with a good case would be the one typewriter I would, I would, I would take. And that's why it's kind of out right now. I rotate this one into use an awful lot. I confess. I'm not picking the typewriter because I think it's hip. It's the best version of the idea that's ever come around, you know? And for me, I think the best way to live is to incorporate the best of the last hundred years into a hybrid that works. Write a book on a typewriter and promote it on Twitter, you know? Why not use the spectrum? You just have to make sure you get yourself a typewriter on eBay or, you know, some Blade Runner-y kind of back alley deal, and say, well, I'm happy to be typing on it. I think they're here, I think they're coming back, and uh, I think they're gonna be around for a while. We got a pretty good supply right now. Herb's always out looking for them. You know, he's at flea markets, he's at garage sales. There's still a lot of them out there. We've got a good supply, but I kind of believe that you can never have too many. Okay. You know, you can never have too many. But I, I like you uh, more in the loss of the typewriter. And then you uh, uh, come up with an app. I came up with an app. Hank's writer, Hank's with an X. And I gotta tell you, man, I have made literally hundreds and hundreds of dollars off of this thing. <laughs> I have figured out how to make a computer work like a typewriter. 
We're having people come in the shop and say, you know, I just did a Google search for typewriter repair, and you popped up. In World War II, there used to be the reporters' uh, typewriter, mm -hmm. and they used to send in a report from the battlefield. So they've been to World War II and back, so that's a lot of sentimental value, I guess. They're coming from all over the place, from far away as L.A., one's from San Diego. It really shows what the website did. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm certainly no uh, prophet I can't see into the future, but we're hanging in there. You know, California typewriter is here, and we still repair typewriters. It was too directly bound to its own anguish to be anything other than a cry of negation carrying within itself the seeds of its own destruction. That's the last two lines of the Encyclopedia Britannica description of the Dada movement of art. You could use that to explain anything in the world. It's the ultimate all-purpose answer. If it takes a hen and a half, a day and a half, to lay an egg and a half, how long does it take a one-legged grasshopper to kick the seeds out of a dill pickle? What are you going to say, two seconds, two minutes, two days? Completely boring compared to that question. When you explain things, you rob them of their mystery. Questions are far more interesting than answers. You know, there's no meaning to the universe, but you might say our job is to give it meaning. But that's for our amusement. The universe could care less. I like the feeling of making something with my hands. I like working with my hands. I like to paint. I like to build things. And with this machine, I'm working with my hands. I just feel this incredible tension as I get older between what I would like to see happen and what's just going to happen anyway. You know, I'm not going to bemoan the passing of an era. There was a certain point where everything left me in the dust. <laughs> I was happy to be left in the dust. <laughs> but all this, it's all going away. The only people that will keep this up is insane people and, and dilettantes and, and artists. Mad geniuses like myself and a handful of other people. 